and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Bob Riley, the director, and we're extremely pleased to bring uh, to you today Dr. Hai Rothstein, who recently retired from the faculty at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Hai spent uh, considerable time in Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Philippines observing the conduct of those wars. He's the author of Afghanistan and the Troubled Future of Unconventional Warfare, and he's contributed to and edited Afghan Endgames, <laughs> Strategy and Policy Choices for America's Longest War. He's also edited a comprehensive volume on deception titled The Art and Science of Military Deception, and Assessing War, which addresses the challenges of measuring success and failure during war. Dr. Rothstein also served in the U.S. Army as a Special Forces Officer for more than 26 years. He is a graduate of West Point Military Academy. His topic today is, Who Lost Afghanistan? Dr. Rothstein. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Hi Rothstein, um, and Bob Riley, uh, a close friend, somebody who I admire, asked me to talk a little bit about uh, Afghanistan. So the talk is titled, Who Lost uh, Afghanistan? So what happened uh, on September 11th, 2001, almost 19 years ago, resulted in a very unorthodox, but also very successful military campaign to remove the Taliban regime uh, from power. That was the same regime that provided sanctuary to Osama bin Laden uh, and to al-Qaeda. By early December of 2001, every major city in Afghanistan uh, had fallen. The Taliban and al-Qaeda uh, had been crushed. Now this brilliant uh, initial uh, victory, this brilliant success was followed by 18 years of inept policy and strategy by civilian and military leaders from the United States. Afghanistan, I think, eventually will be a case study on how not to exercise military and political power. Uh, let me note that uh, over the last 18 plus years, we have been fighting uh, predominantly the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan, who are never a direct threat to the United States. We have not been fighting al-Qaeda, the perpetrators of 9-11, uh, who uh, really by uh, early 2002 uh, had a very, very limited presence uh, in Afghanistan. Sometimes the fact that fact is often uh, forgotten. So the focus of this talk will be uh, mostly on issues of policy and politics not so much uh, on strategy uh, and military operations. Uh, a talk on military, uh, the military campaign would really be a talk unto itself, uh, and that uh, should uh, be postponed to a future time. Um, but let me say that the senior military leaders uh, uh, over the last uh, 18 years uh, would be dominant uh, on the list of people uh, who lost Afghanistan because at almost every turn, the military's response in that country was inappropriate. Uh, even the initial success that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, uh, the plan for that was not generated by the military. It was generated by the CIA, but the CIA recognized that it required uh, military forces uh, to respond. Uh, but let me uh, say something to be at least uh, fair to the military leaders who I've said did not perform very well. A military campaign, or at least a successful military campaign, is impossible without a clear uh, policy purpose. And a policy purpose that is just in the eyes of the people who live in the area uh, where you are waging war. And a clear, achievable, and just policy purpose in Afghanistan has been elusive, uh, again, over three uh, administrations. Um, I'll say one thing about the policy, uh, about the military plan before I get to the heart of my talk. 
And that's the military, once the military recovered from uh, initial success in Afghanistan, it snatched defeat from the jaws of victory by employing large troop formations inappropriately. Even the counter-terrorism fight that was fought with precision by America's most elite units uh, proved to be uh, astrategic. So I'll discuss um, what happened uh, in Afghanistan in two distinct phases for analytical purposes. Uh, the first phase is really what took place over what I'll call the Bush-Obama era, and that's the era of the original sin. Uh, phase two is really the Trump phase, uh, and that's in that phase the uh, you know the focus was just get out, get out as quickly as we can. So let me start start with uh, with phase one, the phase of the original sin, and state uh, right up front that. There was a fundamental design uh, flaw, design flaw uh, in U.S. Afghanistan uh, policy. So, simply put, the policy of creating and supporting a strong central government and democratic elections in Afghanistan and a strong centralized security force, the Afghan National Army, was not a formula for success uh, and stability. That design, a strong central government and a strong central security force is the cause, collectively, they both are the cause of instability and continued, continuing growth and strength of the insurgency. So the American policy in Afghanistan has failed to acknowledge the historical uh, lessons of governance uh, in that country. The British, the Soviets, and even the pre-9-11 uh, Taliban wrongly assumed that a strong centralized government could deliver stability. Uh, so every president since 9-11 uh, has doomed the United States by following the well-worn path of failure uh, of many, many countries' uh, histories in Afghanistan. So why a flawed design? Uh, to understand why our policy uh, and the design was flawed, we really must understand how Afghanistan works. The rugged uh, terrain, the ethnic diversity, and the rural nature of Afghanistan have, have historically put uh, the villages in that country beyond the formal control of the central government. Uh, equally important, rural Afghanistan Afghanis are very suspicious of what goes on uh, in Kabul. Uh, their primary allegiance is to local uh, leaders, and that local allegiance is based uh, on kinship. The rural population in Afghanistan, which makes up uh, approximately 75% of the population, rarely see themselves as part of a single nation uh, with common interests. However, uh, that said, rejecting control from Kabul uh, does not mean that Afghanis reject governance. Uh, local institutions in Afghanistan are highly effective uh, be because they are grounded uh, in perceptions of fairness uh, and legitimacy at the local level. So effective and legitimate governments, governance in Afghanistan exists where the central government does not. So regimes that try to impose strong set, central authority generated insurgencies against them. So the United States and its coalition partners uh, have supported a government design that is contrary to the way rural Afghans understand governance. Accordingly, that type of centralized uh, control is opposed in the rural areas. And the presence of foreign troops uh, in these rural areas uh, in the countryside is especially destabilizing uh, when those foreign forces are viewed as defenders of the central government rather than defenders uh, of local leaders. Let me just, uh, in a very general sense, uh, talk about where uh, legitimacy comes from, what the sources uh, of legitimacy uh, are. So the first source of legitimacy uh, can be uh, referred to as traditional sources, and that would be based on culture, dynastic, and tribal uh, affiliations. The second source of legitimacy uh, would be religious uh, legitimacy, and that's based on charismatic religious leaders, uh, as well as a religious ideology that the population 
uh, believes in. Uh, and, the th and the third general source of uh, legitimacy would be a legal and institutional uh, sources, elected representatives, for example. So Afghans recognize the first two, traditional and, resist and religious sources of legitimacy. Um, we demanded uh, that they acknowledge the third source of legitimacy, uh, which is legal and institutional. They do not recognize that as a legitimate source uh, of, of, of legitimacy. So therefore, uh, they rejected uh, what we and the co our coalition partners uh, put in, face, in place. Uh, and this is, again, the source of resistance and failure in our efforts over the last 18 plus years. We, ig we ignored uh, the two recognized sources of legitimacy. And again, I'll repeat, those are traditional and religious uh, sources. Obviously, the consent of the governed matters. Uh, and increased government legitimacy would go a long way to diffusing the insurgency. But at every turn, we went uh, in the wrong direction. So US policy and the central government that it helped create provoke and empower the insurgency. Now, this is why all of the programs and initiatives and investments that the United State, States has made has not thwarted the Taliban uh, at all. One other point, the Afghan government uh, is hooked to a US life support system. If the US government pulls the plug, the Afghan government uh, and what we've created in Kabul uh, will die. This is not a good option. Alternatively, a permanent dependency by the Afghan government on the United States is also not a good option. So let me outline what the features of an effective policy and strategy in Afghanistan uh, would have looked like if we uh, chose to implement uh, a reasonable uh, and effective policy uh, many years ago. And let me just assume that our goal in Afghanistan is to create a stable uh, and secure ally whose territory is, would not be a safe haven uh, for terrorists. So the theme would be uh, for a, a legitimate and an effective policy, the theme or objective would be, uh, uh, would be to decentralize power, to conform to the historical traditions of successful govern governance in Afghanistan. In other words, fix the original sin that I talked about earlier. So the features would be first, uh, well, let me just sort of summarize uh, to start with uh, by a little slogan that would go, go long, go small, and go local. So what do I mean by going local? Well, that would mean that Afghan stability would really depend on local political arrangements, you know, rather than uh, relying uh, on control from Kabul. Going small would mean uh, relying mostly on for small, um, specialized, probably special forces like troops working with and through uh, local uh, legitimate uh, institutions at a village level. And going long uh, would mean uh, being prepared to stay as long as it takes uh, to create uh, stability and security uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, the other thing that would be essential, and much of this has already happened based on, a draw, on our drawdown, not based on strategy, but close most of the bases. Uh, the existing uh, infrastructure and expenditure of these bases uh, is really a source of, uh, of corruption and a source uh, of the insurgency. What would, the, uh, what would the sources or what would the features of, uh, of, of good policy in Afghanistan have been? And again, assuming that we want a, uh, a, a government in Afghanistan that is um, self-sustaining, uh, that is legitimate in the eyes of the people, uh, that is stable uh, and secure, uh, and is able to uh, keep their territory from being a safe haven uh, for terrorists. You know, what would we uh, want as a policy? Um, well, the theme of the policy would have to be a, a decentralizing power to conform with the historical Afghan traditions uh, of governance. Uh, and that would be, uh, uh, for example, um, we would have to focus at a local level. Uh, 
uh, we would have to um, have um, elements of the government operate in a very small way at the local level. Uh, and we would have to operate uh, for the long term in that country. And let me let me sort of clarify that because I don't think that was clear enough. Uh, going local would mean Afghan stabil stability would depend uh, on local political uh, arrangements, you know, rather than control from Kabul. Uh, going small would be, you know, having, uh, for example, American special forces working with Afghan local Afghan uh, forces. Um, at a village level, uh, working with legitimate uh, local institutions. And going long would mean uh, staying in Afghanistan uh, and being prepared to stay there for long, as long as it takes uh, to make sure the country remains uh, stable. Um, we would have to close all of the major bases in Afghanistan, U.S. bases, and a lot of that has been done as a result of our drawdown. Uh, but the reason for closing these bases is they're a source of instability. Um, these uh, bases uh, fuel the insurgency and they fuel corruption in the country because of the resources that become available uh, you know, throughout the country based on the influx of uh, money and resources that the United States uh, infuses into that country. Um, development projects. Uh, we would have to stop many of the development uh, projects. Um, unless, of course, the locals uh, make in-kind investments uh, in those projects. It's important for the locals to have uh, skin in the, skin, uh, in the game. Um, we would also have to increase our efforts to identify young, nationalistic, legitimate Afghan leaders uh, who will cut deals that will lead to stability. Cutting deals in that country is a way of life. Um, and we would reward, reward uh, individuals and localities uh, for good governance. And I mean good governance Afghan style. And we would invest uh, in those areas where, where violence uh, is neither tolerated uh, or uh, exported. In other words, we would start rewarding the peacemakers, not the war makers. The current incentive structure really incentivizes uh, fighting. Um, we would also uh, push to downsize the Afghan National uh, Army uh, and again develop local professional uh, security forces at the lowest practical uh, level. Um, but the Afghan Army is an important entity. It has to be strong enough uh, to, uh, uh, to provide security against uh, external threats uh, and inter-regional um, uh, rivalries. Um, maintaining a small U.S. footprint in that country uh, is important to strike uh, high-value terrorist targets uh, or to, to defeat insurgents if they, would, uh, uh, if they would be so stupid as to mass. And I think the last, not the last, the second to last feature would be uh, increasing the diplomatic efforts uh, with Pakistan and India uh, to help facilitate a strong and stable Afghanistan. Uh, the final point would be, and Bob and I have spoken about this in the past, but developing uh, an information campaign uh, that articulates the justice of our sh shared cost, with, of our shared interests uh, with the Afghans and undermines the legitimacy of the Taliban. There, are, there really has never been an information campaign that talks to the justice of our shared cause uh, and undermines the legitimacy of what the Taliban is trying to do. So let me move to phase two right now, and that's the, uh, the Trump uh, era. Uh, and the Trump era um, really is signified, or what we see in the Trump era, era is um, an acknowledgement, and maybe falsely so, that uh, winning is no longer an option in Afghanistan. Um, so if winning is no longer an option, uh, what we see in the Trump era is efforts to get out of Afghanistan uh, at all costs. And that's the focus right now. Um, now, sadly, uh, US leaders uh, in what has become America's longest war 
hardly, hardly acknowledge their own culp culpability uh, in, uh, in what is uh, right now a failure in Afghanistan. We, there's a tendency to blame our Afghan partners. Uh, there's a tendency to say um, Afghan political leaders and Afghan security forces are not competent. Uh, there's a tendency to look at Pakistani complicity in this failure, uh, systematic corruption uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, those are some of the uh, normal explanations for failure in that country. However, Washington owns, I think, the, the largest portion of that failure because it was Washington that insisted on a form of government uh, in Afghanistan, again, that, it's, it's, that is inconsistent uh, with the way Afghanistan runs. Uh, again, Washington is responsible because it insisted on a type of government that now exists in Afghanistan and the structure of the security forces that exist that, again, are inconsistent with the way Afghanistan runs. So the failure, I think, was predictable because centralization in that country is utterly inconsistent and unsuited to history, geography, and culture uh, of that country. So it was the American blueprint, the original sin uh, that we are dealing with today that has led us down a road that will result uh, in failure. Now the US seems oblivious to this fact, but the Taliban actually gets it. This explains you know, why the Taliban insist on negotiating with the architect of the debacle, the United States, and they refuse uh, to engage at an official level with the Afghan uh, puppet government. To make matters worse, the fiasco continues. For example, the, the Taliban shows little constraint in, tar in targeting the Afghan National Army uh, and civilians while peace negotiations uh, are ongoing. Uh, our, uh, our, you, our envoy, uh, uh, Zalameh Khali, Khalilzad, continues to negotiate with the enemy or with the Taliban uh, while the Taliban continues to strike uh, at the Afghan government. So you got to ask, you know, why would a negotiating partner who is serious about peace, you know, step up their attacks? The answer is really a simple one, and that's they are not serious uh, about peace. And why would the Taliban uh, be serious about uh, peace? They control more territory now than they did last year uh, and the year before that. Um, they are continuing to expand contested space uh, in that country. And the government of Afghanistan is losing control uh, of space every day as the Taliban's control uh, is growing. So the current trend does not favor a peace settlement that would honor the sacrifice, uh, of sacrifices of those that have been fighting in that country for almost two decades. The Taliban are winning uh, because of our poor strategic choices many, many years ago. Uh, and the fighting uh, makes sense uh, for the Taliban. Uh, and they are strengthened by the fact that our original plan um, is not one that creates legitimacy to the government in that country. So the, 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 the Taliban has a strengthened negotiating position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government uh, of Afghanistan and even the United States. And we find ourselves with a in a bizarre reality right now. The US has agreed to the demands uh, that the Taliban has imposed on us for negotiation. Uh, and that demand uh, is that the Taliban says that the Afghan government cannot be part of those ne negotiations in a formal way. We've agreed to that. So we've agreed to negotiate with our enemy and we've excluded our longtime ally the Afghan government, the government that we put in place uh, from those negotiations. We've put them on the sideline while we, while, while we would negotiate with the enemy. And Khalil Zad himself 
has referred to the Taliban leaders uh, as patriots. So the American diplomacy right now implicitly supports the Taliban's claim that the Afghan government is a puppet regime. And the, and the, and the current diplomatic approach undermines the future uh, of American influence uh, in Afghanistan and the region. And it also signals to our allies uh, that we cannot be trusted. There's another bizarre thing that uh, uh, was troubling. The Afghans uh, have a very, very capable national security advisor, an advisor to President Ghani. His name is Dr. Hamdullah Mohib. Uh, he is uh, Western educated. He has an American wife. Uh, he is the type of young man that uh, we would see as the future uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, he expressed some legitimate frustration in the way that the United States is negotiating with the Taliban uh, and has uh, been okay with the Taliban excluding the Afghan government uh, from the negotiations. So what happens? Well, U.S. diplomats have put poor uh, Hamdallah Mohib uh, on the persona, persona non grata list. He is no longer considered uh, somebody that the United States can deal with because he very rightly, legitimate, uh, very rightly and legitimately expressed concerns about the way the negotiations uh, are going. So what should we do at this point? Um, first, I think uh, direct negotiations with the Taliban should stop. Under the current conditions, negotiating with the Taliban will not bring peace to the Afghan uh, people and it will damage uh, our future prospects uh, of influence uh, in Afghanistan and in the region. Next, the United States should relook at its interests, its common interests uh, with um, the Afghan government. In other words, where do our interests and the interests of the Afghan government overlap? Uh, and then we need to take a very, very sober look uh, at what price we're willing to spend to defend those interests. At one extreme, the United States, United States can withdraw completely from Afghanistan and stop its financial support. Uh, and we can also uh, falsely claim that we gave it our best shot uh, and the Afghan government blew uh, their chance at creating a better life for their people. This approach would likely result in a, a very, very swift collapse of the Afghan government and open the door for uh, increased influence by Iran, uh, by Russia, by Pakistan, uh, by China. Um, and again, it would finish off U.S. influence uh, in the region. At the other extreme, the United States can maintain uh, its efforts in the country, uh, continue uh, our support, support that has already exceeded uh, the one, mil one trillion dollar figure and more than 2,400 uh, Americans killed and more than 20,000 uh, wounded. Um, these extremes are uh, probably incompatible with both U.S. and Afghan uh, interests, and neither one uh, will, right, will likely bring peace to the uh, Afghan people. And the Goldilocks approach, you know, one that uh, would put the solution somewhere between these extremes, uh, will also uh, not work. Um, the solution to a durable peace uh, in Afghanistan must first fix the original sin, the flawed design of the Afghan government and security for the flawed, flawed design uh, that the United States imposed uh, on the Afghan government with regard to how it governs itself and how its security forces uh, are designed, uh, which is again based on a centralization of power and a centralization of the security uh, apparatus. That just has not worked. So let me just try to conclude by saying the American strategy that has been pursued for over 18 years is not a formula for peace uh, and stability in, in, in Afghanistan. It has been the cause of instability and the continued growth of the insurgency. American political and military leaders lost uh, Afghanistan. 
So the effort to reroute the currents of Afghan culture uh, have come undone. Washington and Kabul must recognize this flaw design, flawed design and move forward to decentralize the approach uh, and create uh, a, a more legitimate uh, form of governance that really conforms uh, with the way Afghanistan uh, works. Afghanistan more than any place else in the world, in Afghanistan more than any place else in the world, all politics uh, is local. And the way the country runs, or the way policy has to be designed, must be consistent with the Afghan views uh, of how the world works and what constitutes legitimate governance, not our views uh, of those topics. Uh, I'll conclude now. Thank you for that devastating appraisal of U.S. misconceived strategy in Afghanistan. Uh, if I may make a comment and then ask you a question, <clears throat> the comment is it seems that the, the root of the original sin uh, was cultural illiteracy uh, that may continue to obtain today <clears throat> since the policy hasn't changed. Hi, you made multiple trips to Afghanistan. You spent a lot of time on the ground uh, over there in different parts of the country appraising the situation. <clears throat> How early did it occur to you that we were on a trajectory for failure and uh, because of your long experience uh, in the Special Forces and in the U.S. Army, uh, you had contacts uh, high in the chain of military command. <clears throat> Did you find any acknowledgement at those higher levels that we were on the wrong track early on? Uh, Bob, I... I, uh, of course, over time, I refined my uh, assessment of what was going on, but uh, as early as uh, early 2002, when I first uh, went to Afghanistan, um, I had uh, concerns about the approach, just looking at it from a, from a military standpoint, because rather than developing you know, local capabilities, local security uh, capabilities based on, again, the culture in the country, I found that uh, uh, the the fight in Afghanistan had reverted to really going after high value targets. In other words, trying our trying to kill our way to success, uh, rather than working with local um, police and security forces to secure the countryside. Uh, we really abandoned the countryside uh, and uh, uh, and focused on a centralized approach to going after. Uh, AQ and Taliban leaders. Uh, that proved to be very, very unsuccessful. Uh, in the years uh, that uh, that uh, went by, uh, it, it became clear to me that the entire centralized approach uh, was inconsistent with what uh, historically uh, would bring stability to the country. And I actually had many uh, conversations with every very senior leaders and much of what I prescribed uh, um, in the middle of my talk during what I called phase one, uh, the Bush-Obama era, uh, I uh, offered to senior leaders in the government uh, as a prescription for success uh, in writing uh, up to the office of the vice president of the United States during this administration um, and uh, there was some acknowledgement that what I was saying was true, but there was little appetite to try to change uh, the way we were operating. Now, I'll also say that I mentioned uh, Hamdullah Mohib, who was also the Afghan ambassador to the United States before he went back to Afghanistan to essentially be President Ghani's national security advisor. Um, I got to know him fairly well, and, and, and I had invited him out to the Naval Postgraduate School uh, to speak to our students. Um, and I've had subsequent conversations with him um, over the years. Uh, and I discussed the de decentralized approach 
with him. Um, and he also acknowledged that Afghanistan runs in a very decentralized way. And he acknowledged that there was some room for that approach being accepted in Kabul, although Ghani is a very centralized type manager. Uh, Mohib acknowledged the role of decentralized governance uh, in, in that country. So I think there are windows of opportunity to decentralize the approach, uh, but uh, because the United States was not interested, um, it really never got any traction. Are there parallels in the strategic uh, failure in Afghanistan with those in Vietnam, most particularly as the strategy was conceived and conducted by General Ms. Westmoreland, uh, was, which was to the neglect of South Vietnamese forces who were not supplied with weapons uh, as, as good as the uh, Soviet weapons with which the North Vietnamese were fighting them, nor the kind of training they needed to fight in that war with the idea that, well, the, we'll do it. Well, we'll Americans, we'll, we'll take them out and we'll, we'll, you know, we won't waste our time with these uh, Vietnamese local forces. Uh, did you, do you see any analogies to Vietnam and this failure in Afghanistan? Um, I, I do, Bob, uh, but the, um, I think we recognized uh, early on that um, we didn't want to conduct the fight uh, in a unilateral uh, way. We started that way uh, but even in the early days, the Northern Alliance was a key ally in toppling the Taliban. I mean, there were only about 100 special forces and combat controllers on the ground in the early days, uh, along with U.S. air power. You know, uh, uh, that coupled with the Northern Alliance, you know, toppled the Afghan government and sent uh, al-Qaeda running to the hills. So there was a recognition that much of the fight, most of the fight had to be done uh, by locals. But it's but what, what the similarity though to uh, Vietnam is that we felt that through attrition, in other words, by applying military power uh, to attrit the enemy, uh, victory could be had. Um, that proved to be false in, in, in Vietnam, and it is also uh, a, a not the path to victory in Afghanistan. We can't kill our way to victory. The idea of developing local security capabilities that would thwart uh, the Taliban um, and would secure legitimate local governance was really a second uh, thought uh, to, uh, to the U.S. approach and to actually the Afghan approach uh, also. And that's because we were instructing the Afghans. So we, rather than build from the village level up, uh, we decided to build from the top down. Uh, you know, in theory, you want to build from both ends and come to the middle. But we focused on a top-down approach, uh, a centralized approach, which is not uh, the way to secure uh, that country uh, and to make it stable. Well, as we're on the cusp of failure right now, uh, can we look past that failure to any internal Afghan political forces uh, of a local nature that oppose the Taliban's return to power and would have the means to take action against it, number one. Uh, number two, has the Taliban in any convincing way demonstrated a change in its character that would make it more acceptable, broadly acceptable to the Afghan people, or has the memory of their brutal time in power remained? Um, you know, the Afghan people have no love for the Taliban. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't a certain legitimacy to the way they operate. The Taliban understand that legitimacy comes from religious and dynastic uh, sources. Uh, the Taliban run 
for example, Sharia courts, which are ver considered very legitimate uh, in that country. Um, and the government runs courts sort of Western style, style that aren't considered that legitimate and are also subject to uh, being corrupt. So there is a certain level of legitimacy that the Taliban has um, that is accepted in the rural areas, even though the people uh, are not inclined to like the Taliban. I think the Taliban have modified their approach somewhat. And I think uh, if we go, if, if Afghanistan went to a decentralized way of governance, there may be certain areas in the country that uh, would prefer Taliban-led local governance. And I think we would have to be prepared to accept that as long as it is uh, the type of governance that has um, some connection to the desires of the people uh, in that area. So um, the, the Taliban does have a certain degree of legitimacy. Um, they have changed their ways a little bit, but the population of Afghanistan probably would never accept a Taliban-led regime again, although that may be what happens down the road, because again, um, the way we've structured things is really, um, the way we've structured it does not bode well for the future of the centralized government in that country. Well, is there a prospect of the country degenerating uh, back into a warlordism, uh, the kind of situation in which it was before the Taliban uh, initially took over the country? Uh, um, without any local security capabilities and legitimate local governance, yes. Um, that's why, you know, the idea of, of legitimate local government governance and, and legitimate local security forces are so important because they would thwart um, even the Taliban forcing their way into power at a local level. Um, in uh, what a, you know, you know, after my first trip or so to Afghanistan, I wrote this book and 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 uh, on Afghanistan, and one of the things that I found very uh, interesting is uh, if you develop local security forces under the control of the local shura um, and you have some sort of reasonable security in the area, um, the economy in the area becomes pretty good. Uh, the people thrive in that area uh, and the security force uh, has the support of the people, the support of the local legitimate government uh, and uh, it's sufficient to thwart um, illegitimate warlords from taking over. Um, so that's why it's so important to develop capabilities at a local level because those capabilities, excuse me, those capabilities cannot be rapidly exported from Kabul to uh, a village hundreds of miles away. Uh, let me ask you, hi, if I may, a question about the future of the National Army in Afghanistan on which so much money has been spent for <laughs> training and equipment. Uh, as you have pointed out repeatedly, a strong national government uh, is not culturally or politically accepted in Afghanistan. Um, as the Taliban gains more and more control of territory, what will happen to this national army? Will, will it disintegrate um, and will its forces return to local allegiances, allegiances um, uh, or to the local warlords? What, what's going to happen to the Afghan national army, particularly the, as we recede further and further? The, um, well, first of all, I mentioned in my talk that the Afghan government and army are tied to a U.S. umbilical cord. Right. If that cord is ever cut, both collapse, in my mind, very, very quickly. The Afghan army um, has a desertion rate that's incredible. And again, it's because of the way we've designed the army. 
we bring people from the countryside to the center and think that that army and those troops want to stay uh, in Kabul and defend the central government. No, they want to defend their villages. So taking those same people that come from the country and bring them to the center, uh, if we would reverse that and recruit people at a local level, train them and make them part of a local security force, they would fight for uh, local security. So uh, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is the collapse of, I think, the Central Army uh, w would take place fairly rapidly once the United States uh, loses uh, interest. Um, and you would find warlordism, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS perhaps trying to dominate the local scene if the locals are incapable of protecting themselves uh, and if the local governing structure uh, is incapable of generating forces to defend themselves. Uh, isn't it too, uh, too late for that, um, particularly in light of the fact that uh, uh, the, the original sin has never been, let us say, cleansed, that there is no acknowledgement that the strategy with which we began, began, it was so fundamentally flawed so that now yeah. we would understand we've got to tra train the forces for their local operation? Yeah, uh, again, um, one of the proposed solutions would have to be fix that original sin. You, mm. We cannot create a, a stable uh, country uh, that its government is considered legitimate if we don't do something about that original sin and the policy that surrounds that original sin. I think that there is actually room uh, to, con to still do that. Um, people like Abdullah Mohib would be a very, very good negotiating partner to try to force a decentralization of governance. Um, the reality is that the government in Kabul will actually strengthen its hand and, um, and uh, ensure its ability to survive if they decentralize. If they don't, they're on a timeline towards, um, you know, towards this destruction. So I think even at this point, if the United States acknowledges the policy failures of the last 18 years uh, and pushes hard with the Afghan government uh, to decentralize and create local capability, I think it's still possible uh, to turn this around. But uh, Again, we'd have to uh, be willing to invest for the long term in this. But again, I don't think this requires the same level of investment that we have already made. I think it really can be a, a fraction of that of that investment and can really, uh, and the return on inv that investment can be very, very significant. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, let me ask you, uh, when uh, you mentioned the Afghan National Army, uh, that it needs to maintain a capability against external threats to Afghanistan. Uh, what might those external threats be? Um, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, you know, Russia uh, has been uh, trying to expand their influence in the country. Uh, Afghans don't like foreign influence. The Pakistanis uh, continue to uh, try to extend their influence uh, in the country. Uh, I think U.S. President, presence now tamps down uh, on both uh, Russian uh, and um, Pakistani influence. Iran uh, has tremendous influence and, and forces in the country along the shared border. Uh, even Chinese and chi even Chinese. Uh, uh, influence in that country is uh, is is on the rise. Um, so um, there are plenty of countries in that region that would like to replace U.S. U.S. influence uh, in in the country. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, we can. In many ways, you know, they would be in for the same host of issues that the United States faces because I'm not sure they understand any better than we do on how that country operates. Um, but the Afghan army needs to be able to not only be a deterrent against external 
uh, forces, but there are also uh, potential problems inside the country. If one if one region has a feud with another region, you know that is a responsibility of the central government to try to deal with, um, not interfere with what goes on within a province uh, or a locality. But if there are conflicts between and among different localities, um, that is something that the central government has traditionally uh, dealt with. So, uh, central uh, central military to deal with external threats. Uh, and with threats uh, or um, or problems uh, between and among ethnic uh, groups within the country or regional groups within the country. Uh, hi, you referred to the possibility of the loss of U.S. influence in Afghanistan to Iran, Russia, Pakistan, China, etc. But what is that influence worth? I mean, what is it actually? that the United States would lose. Uh, what level of strategic significance is Afghanistan to the United States at this point? I, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and it's one I'm sure that the current administration, um, you know, has looked at, uh, you know, looks at, and that's why maybe they want to uh, pull the plug. Uh, perhaps another way to look at it is that uh, our failure in Afghanistan um, and our willingness to support our enemy of 18 years, the Taliban, versus the government that we created, I think can have a long-term impact on our relations with friends and allies throughout the world because it demonstrates that we can't be trusted, uh, that we're fickled, that we don't follow through, that uh, uh, we uh, you know, don't understand um, the nature of what goes on in other cultures and other countries, uh, and we're perhaps not, not a particularly good ally. So I think this is uh, you know, the potential of, of getting out and, and Afghanistan collapsing I think uh, really is a uh, a signal to our allies that uh, they have to reconsider uh, us as a um, strategic partner. And and one final question: uh, the presence of uh, Al Qaeda in Afghanistan uh, was uh, the principal cause of our going in there in the first place. Uh, to what extent do you think our failure in Afghanistan is going to lead to a recurrence of that kind of danger? Uh, I, I don't think it's the same danger that it used to be, to be quite frank. As a matter of fact, before we went into Afghanistan in 2001, the Taliban had already gotten tired of Al-Qaeda. They were getting ready to throw them out of the country uh, on their own because they were creating a threat you know, to the Taliban uh, regime. So um, it's not clear that the Taliban would, uh, if they came to power, uh, would tolerate either al-Qaeda or ISIS operating in the country. Now, whether or not they were powerful enough to thwart, uh, you know, the presence of those entities in the country is a different uh, question. Um, the Taliban knows what happened to them after 9-11. I mean, we bombed the hell out of them and pushed them out of power. I think they've learned and would not make the mistake uh, again that would trigger that type of uh, response. Uh, Dr. Rothstein, I want to thank you very much for taking time today to talk to the Westminster Institute. I hope you will come back to discuss the other side of the issue, which you said would be another talk, and that's the military dimensions. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. Bob, it's always a pleasure to have anything to do with you and the Westminster Institute. Thank you, Hi.